And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. A quick little Simpkins Business Corner Express for you here this morning before our day kicks up. You might hear a bell here. Above wax is launched at 10 meters per second at some unknown angle. What's the velocity at height 5 meters above the ground? All right. So this a problem appears tricky because we don't know what angle we're being launched at here. All right. But if we are launched at uh, with a speed of 10 meters per second, what we do know is that we have an initial kinetic energy. Now, we'll assume that this launching occurs from the ground uh, because that's where we usually launch from. And it's asking about what is the velocity of this thing at a height of 5 meters above the ground. Right? So when you have a height of 5 meters, this is up here, you see that now my velocity vector is a little shorter because I'm not moving as fast because as we go on the way up, we're going to be slowing down due to that downward acceleration due to gravity. And uh, we want to figure out what's going on exactly with that. But we do know we have kinetic energy and we know we have potential energy. So I'm going to call this down here Ki and up here Kf for initial and final. And of course, our UGF. Now, any problem that we do uh, that has to do with the height or the speed or a spring is going to be hinting at this idea of the conservation of energy. That is the idea that the total energy in a system at one point must equal to the total energy of a system at another point. Unless, of course, there's work done by a non-conservative force, which there isn't here. And so we have to write our energy expression. What we can say is that the initial k is equal to the final k plus the ug final. And so that's going to look a little something like this. Uh, 1 half mv squared is our equation for kinetic energy. 1 half mv final squared plus, all right, and then, oops, sorry about that, right there. ug is going to be mg, and I'll call it h because it's called the height h there. All right. So all we got to do is plug this in for figuring this out. Now you might notice that the m, the mass, is in every single term on both sides of the equation, which means we can cancel those out. And so we got 10 meters per second. We're going to square that equals one half the unknown velocity, which is what we're aiming to solve for here. And I love it when it skips around like that on me. And then we have 9.8 meters per second squared times the height of 5 meters. So from here, it's just an algebra problem. I'm going to pause and do some magic algebra. Algebra Kazam, and there it is. The velocity final is 1.41 meters per second. All right, so the idea here is you set the total energy at the beginning equal to the total energy at the height of 5 meters. Identify what kinds of energy, write your conservation of energy expression. How about this one? This one's a little tricky. The water slide at mild, mild moisture monarchy, wild water kingdom, has a six meter tall slide and it's uh it's 50 meters long so what that means is like this like that's 50 meters and it happens to be six meters tall so just to kind of draw a picture for that if the coefficient of friction between you and the slide is oh so there's a little a little not so slippery part here there is a little bit of friction how fast are you moving at the bottom all right well at the top we have all ug and at the bottom we're going to have all k because we are at a height of zero however we just said in the last problem that the total energy before is equal to the total energy after unless work is done by a non-conservative force. Friction is an example of a type of non-conservative force. And so think of it this way. If I have a thousand joules up here and I only have 800 left over down here, right? Here's my thousand. Then this would have to be some negative work that was done. In fact, that's the work done by friction. So whenever you're doing an energy problem, if you have to con consider non-conservative work, that is how you would account for that. Now, we know that work is force times distance, all right, plus mg, uh, call it uh, h, equals one-half mv squared, okay? And the force of friction, further, we know the force of friction is going to be equal to mu times fn, okay? Oh, this is going to get nasty, all right, because it's asking for how fast we are going at the bottom. Now, the problem with this is that we have a slide and the force of gravity is straight down and the normal force is this way. So that might present us with a little bit of a challenge. Uh, perhaps we could get a little slide with this though. Let's see. So we have six. We're going to call this, we're going to define this angle over here because that's the ramp angle we usually like. So this is opposite. That's hypotenuse. And so I'm going to use sine. So I'm going to say sine of theta equals uh, opposite over hypotenuse. And if I solve for theta there, I just do the inverse sine of 6 divided by 50. Make sure your calculator's in degree mode. And this is a pretty tiny angle, uh, 6.89 degrees. <clears throat> okay. Um, now, we've done this before where we understand that the normal force is, in this case, is not equal to the force of gravity. 
So there's going to be a little bit of a component dealio going on here. And so the normal force is going to be equal to Fg uh, perpendicular, which we have defined before. Fg perpendicular is equal to Fg cosine of theta. If you're wondering why, take a look at this angle. It looks like, looks like that one, doesn't it? Right? And then you'd be working with adjacent and hypotenuse. And that's why we get the cosine out of that. So what does that mean? That means that Fn is equal to mg cosine of theta. So come on back up here. Now what we're going to do here is we have FF, so that's going to be equal to mu times Fn, which we just found to be mg cosine of theta times d plus mgh uh, equals, sorry about that, equals one half mv squared. Now the masses are going to cancel on each of these terms, so what are we left with? We got mu g cosine of theta d equal, uh, plus, sorry about that, uh, gh, that's a weird looking plus sign, isn't it? There we go. Uh, equals one half v squared. And so now we're just going to plug everything in. So uh, 0 0.08 times 9.8 times cosine of 6.89, which you can imagine is a pretty tiny number is going to come out of that, times the distance, which is uh, 50 meters, equals uh, g, sorry, plus again, uh, plus 9.8 times 6, I'm running out of room, equals one half v squared. All right, I'm gonna clean up some space and do a little algebra magic for you guys here. And after a little bit of algebra magic, we are going to get our answer there. Velocity is 6.3 meters per second. You can just kind of follow along the plug. So this one turned out to be really crazy because we had to come back and apply these ideas that we had from last unit, from dynamics two units ago, I guess, of a component of the force of gravity. But with that tool, we could figure out how fast we're moving at the bottom. All right, let's look at our last one with this little juicer on an assembly line. All right, so, oops, sorry about that. Let's look at the juicer on an assembly line here. We got an assembly line. It's ejected from the assembly line by a spring. So we got this little bang and an assembly line. After leaving the spring, it slides across a Teflon surface before striking a bumper. At what velocity does it strike the bumper? Okay, so at the beginning, we had all US potential in the spring. Uh, at the end, here this thing's moving pretty fast, right? Uh, we have K. So basically, that's what we're looking at. What's the velocity that strikes the bumper? That's going to come from the kinetic energy. But, of course, this is the surface that has some friction of uh, 0.1. So we're going to lose some energy. So again, how does this look? Well, the energy before is equal to the energy after. I should say the energy at one point in the system is equal to the energy, total energy in another part of the system, unless work is done by non-conservative force. Ah, which brings me back to, you're probably like, Mr. Simpkins, hold the phone. You did something really drastic here and didn't explain it at all. My apologies. Because we are, uh, in this previous one, because we're sliding down the ramp, that's the direction of the displacement, but the force of friction is up the ramp. Now, what is the angle difference in the direction of these two vectors? One is down, one is up. It's 180 degrees. And we know that back here in the, in the work equation, right here, oh, sorry about that, right here, this one, in the work equation, we know that really what I should have written here is force times displacement times cosine of theta, right, which is the theta is defined there as the difference in the uh, direction between the force and the displacement. So if we do that correctly, we have negative work done. Now, it would have, hopefully it would have um, struck you that our answer was a little off if you didn't do the negative here, right, because we'd be getting like a huge amount of energy. Just think about this logically. Is the work being done by friction going to add energy to our system or take it away? The answer, of course, is it's going to take it away. So that's why this negative showed up right here. All right, so let's go back now, considering that uh, this number will end up being a negative number because we're doing negative work with the force of friction, and we'll continue with this problem. 